All right, so when I, oh, I forgot to share my screen. Okay, so when I flip over, I want somebody with a mic to tell me that they can uh, see this PowerPoint or when they can see it. You can see it. Thank you so much. Okay, so let me start this. All right, so exam three, and it's loading, it's loading. All right, exam three survival guide. So as you all know, the exam is it'll open on Friday. Actually, I don't like this. Yeah, I, I don't like the other way. All right, so the exam is going to open on Friday at five and it'll close Sunday at 1159. Same as usual. Um, the group exam will be next Monday. So exactly one week from today at your normal time. Um, I do want to mention that the group exam will happen in the separate group exam collaborate link. I know that was a big issue for my class. And honestly, part of it was my fault because I forgot to set in the other link um, and tell you all. So I take full responsibility for half of it. Um, but so. Next exam, I'll be in that link to direct you to the right link, but you make everybody's life easier if you just go to the group exam link in the first place. Okay. I talked about that in a way roundabout way, but I think you all know what I'm saying. All right. So basically, exact same format. Um, there's 26 questions on the individual exam, a few more on the group. Um... You'll be randomly selected in groups. We actually do not pick you in groups. The collaborate gods put you in groups. Um, so you will not have the same group that you had last time or anything like that. Okay. All right. So on this exam, it is going to be meiosis, genetics, and whatever we get through of DNA replication. So, first of all, let's just go over a basic review of meiosis. So, the whole goal of meiosis, which is sexual reproduction, um, is genetic diversity. That's the whole goal. Um, in mitosis, the goal is to have a clone cell. If you cut your arm, you don't want to have a liver cell growing on your arm. But, on the flip side of that for meiosis... You don't want to have every single human in the population have um, heart disease because then nobody would live past like 60 or whatever. So, or you don't want to have everybody um, be an asthmatic because if a upper respiratory disease came through, it could wipe out the whole population. So you want to have genetic diversity. Um, for many reasons, but the bare minimum is for just survival of the overall population. It makes them more fit. So the end product or the end result of meiosis is four haploid cells. Who can tell me what a haploid cell is? What's a haploid cell? Is it just one cell? I'm probably wrong. Okay. You're on the right track. So it's just one. It's not a cell. It has to do with how much DNA or how many chromosomes it has. So in relation to how many chromosomes it has, based on the normal, which is diploid, haploid cells have half. The number of chromosomes. So if diploid is 10 chromosomes, then a haploid of that particular species or cell is going to be five chromosomes. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. No problem. All right, so haploid is half. They both kind of start with the same half haploid. All right. 
Okay, so that is the main goal. Now, haploid is also what you put on the sides of your Punnett squares. How you only have one letter. So, like, one letter for mom and one letter for dad. That's what she means by half. So, while a whole genotype would be big B, little b, haploid would just be big B or little b. It would not be both. Okay? All right, so meiosis 1, the main thing you need to know about meiosis 1 is that homologous pairs separate. And homologous pairs are four sister chromatids. In meiosis 2, you separate sister chromatids. And you have half as many chromosomes as diploid. So you have half as many. That means it's haploid. In mitosis, you also separate sister chromatids, but you have a diploid number of chromosomes, so a diploid cell. All right, are these differences clear, everyone? All right, so meiosis one. So prophase one is where the chromosomes line up in homologous pairs and crossing over occurs. Who can tell me what crossing over is and why it's important? Why do we need it? Okay. Diversity, good. Okay, so what is it? What does it look like when we draw our diagram? How would we draw crossing over? How would we draw um, Okay, so this is where the two Good. That's exactly right, Morgan. That's exactly how I would explain it. It has a little bit of each chromosome attached. So a little bit of mom gets over on dad and a little bit of dad gets over on mom. That's exactly right. All right. Prometaphase is pretty much the same no matter if you're talking about meiosis 1, meiosis 2, or mitosis. The centrioles will migrate to the opposite sides of the cell and spindles attach to chromosomes. For metaphase one, the homologous pairs line up on the metaphyseal plate. For anaphase one, the homologous pairs are pulled apart. For telophase one, cytokinesis occurs. So the whole, um, excuse me, the whole goal of meiosis one is just to separate these homologous pairs. Now meiosis two. Remember, you start meiosis 2 with two cells, the two cells that you made from meiosis 1. So in prophase 2, the chromosomes recondense. In prometaphase 2, the centrioles move to opposite sides of the cell and the spindle fibers attach. In metaphase 2, the chromosomes line up on the metaphyseal plate, those sister chromatids. In anaphase 2, the sister chromatids are pulled apart and become daughter chromosomes. In telophase 2, cytokinesis occurs, and the end result of all of this is four haploid cells. Okay, so here is the same graphic that was on my previous PowerPoint. I'm just, I really like this one because it shows exactly what's happening. You have the homologous pairs lining up and crossing over occurs, and then you have the homologous pairs lined up, homologous pairs apart. Then you have this cytokinesis and cleavage furrow. Then you have two cells, sister chromatids line up, sister chromatids pulled apart. This cleavage furrow for, form for cytokinesis to happen. And then you have your daughter cells. Okay, so this was just a really, really brief overview. Is there any questions on meiosis? So now let's move on to the principle of segregation. So the principle of segregation just states that alleles are discrete units and they're independent of each other. So each allele does not depend on the next. They're independent 
they're independent and strong things. They don't need, um, they don't need any, like, they don't rely on anybody. They're like a strong, independent woman. Um, so you have two alleles per gene. So this is where you get the big B, big B, big B, little b, or a little b, little b. All right, so when meiosis occurs, alleles separate, separate, leaving one per gamete. And this leads to the randomness of homologous pairs and how they line up on the metaphysial plate. And link genes also follow this principle. And we will talk about link genes at the end of this unit. I know we haven't talked about that yet. So, um, hold on. I You'll understand it by the end, I promise. Um, all right, so now moving on to Mendel's principle of independent assortment. I'm not sure if we went over this in class yet or if it's farther in on genetics. But basically, this just says that genes separate independently into gametes, um, that the gametes line up randomly in metaphase, and crossing over occurs in prophase one. And link genes also follow this principle. All right, so now genetics overview. Okay. Instead of doing it this way, I'm going to click up here. Okay. If I were to say that someone was homozygous recessive, with everything that you could tell me about them, Okay, so what would their phenotype be? Two of the same allies. Two of the same alleles, right. And that's exactly right, Morgan. It would be like lowercase a, lowercase a. Exactly right. So let's just say that the recessive allele that we're talking about right now is blue eyes. And that little b codes for blue eyes and big b codes for brown eyes. If someone has two, if someone is homozygous recessive, what is their phenotype? Blue eyes, exactly right. Ah. Okay, that was a little test before the actual thing, and I'm really happy with how you guys did. Awesome. Okay, so heterozygous just means that there's two different alleles for the same gene. So that is where you have the big B, little b. Now, in simple dominance, with the heterozygous um, genome, the dominant gene will be expressed because it only needs one allele present for the trait B expressed in the phenotype. Homozygous means that two of the same alleles um, are there for the same gene. So that's where you have the little b, little b, or the big b, big b. So if someone is homozygous recessive, they express the recessive trait. If someone is homozygous dominant, they express the dominant trait. So now a dominant trait is what Dr. Annette talked about, that um, annoying guy at the party that, like, yelled his story. Um, funny story. My roommates actually related this to me when I was talking about it earlier because I have a very, very booming voice. I talk very loud all the time. And they joke that they can hear me no matter where they are. So, um... I always think of myself in that no matter where I am, you're going to be able to hear me. Now, recessive would be someone who's very, like, soft-spoken and very chill and not high-strung and are just kind of laid back. Envy those people with my whole heart, but that is definitely not me. So, these people or this type of allele, both of them have to be present. So, you need both lowercase b's to um, express that in the phenotype. So the genotype is what um, is the gene of the organism. So it's like the uppercase B, the uppercase B, 
um, so on and so forth. The phenotype is what you actually see. If I look at someone with blue eyes, I'm not going to see lowercase b, lowercase b. I'm not going to see letters. I'm not going to see like a chromosome um, diagram. I'm going to see blue eyes. That's what a phenotype is. What When you look at a person, that's what you can actually see. Okay? So, I know we have not gone over polygenic examples yet. But when we go over, make sure you are able to create the possible gametes for a polygenic example. Um, on this exam, you will have to do a few Punnett squares to get to the answers. It is multiple choice, so you, like, one of the questions won't be draw a Punnett square. But in order to find the phenotypic or genotypic ratio, you're going to have to do a Punnett square. But make sure that you allow yourself enough time to do that. You'll still, it's 26 questions on this exam, and you still have the 40 minutes. So, um, this is just where time management and test taking skills come into play. If you don't know an answer, it's totally okay to skip it and go on. Get to the ones you do know first. And you also need to know how to do a simple dominance example. And... Why didn't I? Oh, okay. No, I didn't do that. All right. So simple dominance is what we have just discussed. If a if one uppercase letter is displayed, then that's the phenotype. So say that's why it's much more common for someone to have brown eyes than blue eyes. Because blue eyes is recessive and brown eyes is dominant. Okay. All right. So now we're going to get into... Where were these right now? All right. Now we're going to get into the different types of inheritance besides simple dominance. Because if everything was simple, then we wouldn't <laughs> we wouldn't need geneticists and my future career would be a blimp, a dream. <laughs> so we're in life, nothing's that simple. So what happens when complications of when complications abound? That's how she titled her slides. All right, so the first type is incomplete dominance. So this is where both alleles are dominant. Think of this like um, like you're watching two people fight. And I'm sure you guys have seen like some reality TV show like um, Desperate Housewives, America's Next Top Model, stuff like that, where some pe somebody will get mad at somebody else, and next thing you know, they're both yelling at each other, and they both are stubborn. They both want to get in the last word. So you can't really hear what each individual person is saying. You just hear a muddle of it, and you're just, you just hear screaming, and you don't know what's happening. That is what incomplete dominance is. Both alleles are so loud, you can't hear each individual piece. So as a result of this, you only have three possible genotypes with no recessive traits. So because they're both dominant, you won't have any recessive traits. So the third genotype is the mix of the first and the second. So, say you have a white cat that makes with a black cat to make a gray cat. So, here you have white cat is WW, black cat is BB, and a gray cat is WB. Now, on a solid gray cat, I can't go in and circle. This part is from mom, this part is from dad. It's an even mix. It's the perfect mix of both mom and dad. There is not one individual piece that is more mom or more dad, even. Okay? Does that make more sense? Okay. 
So now we're going to compare this to codominance. So in codominance, you again have more than one dominant trait, but you can still have a recessive trait. A recessive trait is still an option in codominance. So the main thing is that there's no real mixing of phenotypes. So before I talk about blood type, let's just talk about a typical example. So let's go back to the black cat and the white cat for my incomplete dominance example. If a black mommy cat got with a white daddy cat and codominance occurred, then you would have a black and white spotted cat. There would, you could take this kitten and you could circle, oh, this part is from mom because it's black. This part is from dad because it's white. You will have a perfect mixture, not even. It will be, okay, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's like a salad. You can pick out the croutons. In like a tomato soup, you can't pick out like, the garlic salt is already in there. It's already blended. There's no getting it out because it's smooth and blended. And codominance is chunky. You can pick out the croutons if you don't want them. Okay, does that make more sense? Because now I'm going to talk about the blood type. Okay. Good, 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 good. All right, so blood type. Um, I'm sure most of you know, if only from like Grey's Anatomy, um, that there are four major blood types. Um, there's A, B, AB, and O. Okay, and now we will get into the positive and negative later. That is more polygenic, so we'll probably get into that on like Wednesday. So, blood type is a perfect example of codominance because someone can have type A blood, someone can have type B blood, someone can have type O blood, which is considered recessive, someone can also have type AB blood, and that is because of codominant. So with AB, you have the markers for both A type and B type. So you have the marker for both. You can circle, okay, this part came from mom, she's A, she's A type. This part came from dad, he's B type. They're not mixed. They're chunky. You can pick out the croutons. Okay, so now on the other hand of this, um, we will talk about on Wednesday what makes the blood type positive or negative, but just know that it follows simple dominance. So there is no codominance for what makes it positive or negative, it's just simple dominance. Positive is dominant over negative. Which, again, is why positive blood is more common because it's dominant. So if you only have one allele that is positive, then you have positive blood. Okay? Does this make more sense? I know a lot of people were confused with that in class activity. Okay. All right. Phenotypic plasticity. This is just saying that your environment matters, that no matter what the genetics, well, no matter what your specific genetics are, what environment you're in, what you put in your body, what you do to your body matters. So think of this like the neighbor says nurture debate. This is like nurture. This is what happens. So this is just saying the environment and affects gene coding and expression. So the example she used in class is if you take twin baby bunnies and you put one in warm temperatures, one in cooler temperatures, their skin color is going to be different. 
This can also be with like human twins. If one smokes and one doesn't, then one will have worse teeth, um, more wrinkled skin, maybe lo lower oxygen saturation, stuff like that. This can also happen with plants. If you change, if you put one in a certain pH of soil and another one in the other pH of soil, it can affect the color of their flowers. Okay. All right, so I know we started on X-linked, so I'll go ahead and go over this one. So X-linked traits. So males are XY and females are XX. So the Y allele we will not talk about in this class hardly at all. The Y allele literally only codes for making you male. The X allele or the X chromosomes um they carry everything else so this is why an afflicted x chromosome acts as dominant in males because they only have one x chromosome so say um one x chromosome is marked for color blindness and that and chromosome is passed to a male. Genetically speaking, that male will be colorblind. Now say that that same X chromosome that's afflicted with colorblindness is passed down to a female that has two X chromosomes. That female will be a carrier, which means she can pass it down if she wants to. Well, not if she wants to. If the roulette table <laughs> of genetics lets her or like fate or however you want to say it um she can pass it down she still has it but she won't be colorblind does that make sense how is recess if it's dominant in males because you only have one x chromosome but it's recessive in females because you have two so in order for a female to be colorblind both of her x and chromosomes has to have that colorblind gene on it which is why in diseases such as hemophilia and colorblindness it's very very rare to find a female with that affliction because it is x-linked now, if you are more apt for um, kitty examples, that is why you will never find a male in calico because the calico pattern is excellent. Does that make sense? Okay, so the main thing you need to take away from this is that X-linked traits is the only type of genetics that the sex of the parent who donates the allele matters. So the X-linked trait is the only trait, what well, is the only type of inheritance that sex matters. Okay. All right, so the rest of this we have not gone over. So I'm gonna give you all the toys. If you want me to go over it now, or just stop, I'll quiz you all on what we have went over and I'll send out the PowerPoint as a whole. I'll let you all pick. Do you want me to go over what we haven't gone over yet? Or do you want me to just stop and send out the PowerPoint? Is there going to be another study session to go over the stuff we learned? Um, or we're going to learn? Yes, so Fallon is going to have one on Thursday, um, which by then you should have gone over most of genetics, maybe part of um, DNA replication. So Fallon will have one, and I'll make sure that she goes over all of DNA replication in hers, um, no matter if we get to it on Wednesday or not. Okay.
So one person said he's fine with what we have done. Do I have a second or an objection? Or I just need two people to tell me something and then I'll do it. Majority rules. Uh, we can go ahead. I'm fine with what Eric said. Okay, sounds good. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm not going to stop recording. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I swear, it is literally week 12, and I still don't know how to work this technology half of the time. Okay, so I'll send out all of this. So you guys will have my notes. You'll see what's bolded, because we all know that if I take time out of my life to bold it, it is what? Important. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and take a picture for attendance. And then I'm going to just kind of quiz you all, ask questions, and get your brain juices flowing. Remember, now is when you need to start studying. This is when you will start your five-day study plan. Okay? All right. So... What is the end goal of meiosis one? What are the end products of meiosis one? What will they look like? end product of meiosis one is also the starting product of meiosis two that helps yeah you have two daughter daughter cells how are the chromosomes going to be organized so you do have two of them so how how is the dna organized do you still have the homologous pairs that's my main question that's what i'm trying to hint at Wait, what did you say? All right, so at the end of meiosis one, how is the DNA organized? Is it still in homologous pairs or is it in something else? Like, what's the form of it? So what's the whole point of meiosis one? What's the hallmark? The goal is to do what to the homologous pairs? Okay, that is the whole reason of meiosis in whole. But talking about meiosis one, when you, at the end of meiosis one, okay, what's going to happen to the homologous pairs? Will they still be together or will they be separate? Meiosis one, not all of meiosis. We're breaking this down into stages. They'll all be together, won't they? So at the end of meiosis one, the homologous pairs will be separated at the end. So oh. the whole goal of meiosis one, I shouldn't have said hallmark. That was my fault. The hallmark of meiosis is diversity. You guys are right. But the end goal of meiosis one is to separate those homologous pairs. And like Megan said, you will have two daughter cells, have sister chromatids in them, not homologous pairs. Does that make sense, y'all? And I was really close, Sage. I completely understand that there was there might be a little bit of confusion. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about the end of meiosis two. 
what am I going to find at the end of meiosis 2? Let's start off with just how many cells will I have at the end? Four haploid cells. Awesome job, Morgan. You will have four haploid cells at the end of meiosis 2. So the whole goal of meiosis 2 is to separate the sister chromatids. So meiosis 1, you separate the homologous pairs. Meiosis 2, you separate the sister chromatids. And remember, the homologous pairs are four sister chromatids together. Okay? Okay. What age or what step does crossing over occur? When does crossing over occur? When do they start hand-holding? Prophase, okay, which prophase? One or two? You're right, we just need to be a little bit more specific. Prophase one, exactly right, good job. Okay. That's all of meiosis that I'm going to go over right now because i done a whole other study session on that. I'm going to mainly focus on genetics. And let's do some examples. Okay, so let's just work right now on identifying types of dominance, well, of inheritance given an example. Okay, so. Now, mind you, all of these examples are not genetically accurate. They're just examples I am pulling from my noggin. Okay? Okay. So, let's say a black beetle mates with a red beetle, and they have a ladybug baby. What type of dominance is that? So, a solid red beetle mates with a solid black beetle. They make a ladybug baby. Co dominance. Okay. I'm going to push you a little bit more, Megan. Can you explain to us why you said co dominance? You're right. I just want to hear why you said it. I figured it was easier to use the speaker. Um, but say like you explained it like the salad, how you can pick out the croutons, you can pick out like the red or the black on a ladybug and kind of see like which comes from the mom and which comes from the dad. That's exactly right. Good job. Good job. Okay. So now let's say that. The, okay, so let's say that a mom is a carrier of hemophilia, and she has a son that now has hemophilia. What type of inheritance is this? The mom is a carrier of hemophilia, and she has a son who now has hemophilia. What type of inheritance? X-linked. Okay. I don't want to pick on Megan two times in a row. So does somebody else want to unmute themselves and tell me why you think it's X-linked? It is X-linked. I just want somebody to explain their thought process to me. Okay, so Megan, do you care to do it twice in a row? I'll do it. Um, so the mom carries it, and so like 
the other allele that she has like can like knock that one out. I don't know how to really explain it, but the, the male doesn't have that other X allele to like get rid of it, so he has to carry it. I don't know if that makes sense at all. That makes perfect sense because that's exactly what happens. So the mom is a carrier, so she doesn't express the trait because um, X-linked traits are recessive in females, so she's not going to express it. But she can pass down that allele to her son, who is XY. And remember, we don't care about the Y chromosome. It is nothing important but make you male. So it is going to be dominant in his case. So that's exactly right. Now, another key thing is if she specifies the sex of the parent. So she said a mom is a carrier and has a son. Most of the time, context clues, when we talk about the sex of the parent, it is X-linked. Okay? All right. So, let's say I have... Okay. Say I have twin goldfish, and I put one in salt water and one in fresh water. And the one in salt water turns white, but the one in fresh water stays orange. What's this an example of? So I have twin goldfish. I put one in salt water and one in fresh water. The one in salt water turns white, and the one in fresh water stays orange. What is this an example of? Plasticity. Megan, you're killing it, girl. All right, can somebody else tell me why you think it's plasticity? Okay, go right ahead. I just said your mic is doing that. Never mind. Oh, cool. Okay, you all, I'm going to have to. Okay, has it stopped or can you all still hear me? Better now. It's better now? Okay, apparently it just. Okay. Okay, guys, I am absolutely so sorry. My microphone is horrible. I promise I'm in the process of getting a new computer. It is just so expensive. <laughs> okay, so, well, that gave you all a little while to think about my question. Goldfish, one in salt water, one in fresh water. The one in salt water is white and the one in fresh water is orange. Why? I think Megan used the plasticity, right? So who wants to take the burden from Megan? Exactly, Morgan. It is depending on their environment they're in. Exactly. So they're twins. They have the same genotype. But because one is in salt water and one is in fresh water, the expression of their phenotype changes. That's exactly right. Okay, last one, and then I will let you guys go enjoy your night. Okay, so now let's say that. Okay, let's say that a. Polar bear gets with a black bear and has a panda bear. Now, this is totally not 
not how it happens. But if a polar bear gets with a black bear or mates with a black bear and has a panda bear, what is it? Incomplete? Okay, so let's think about this. A panda bear has black and white spots on it, right? So it's a salad. You can pick out the croutons. Co-dominance, right. And I see your confusion, Sage, because I already done co-dominance. So I lied. We're going to do one more that you guys already know what it's going to be, but it's going to be a good example, okay? All right, so let's say a... Let's say a dark green octopus gets with mates with a white octopus and makes a lime green octopus. What type of inheritance is this? Dark green octopus with a white octopus to make a lime green or light green octopus. It's incomplete dominance. Right. And that's because it is a blended tomato soup. You cannot pick out the garlic salt even if you really hate garlic. It's in there. Okay. It's a nice even blend. Okay. All right. So that's all I have. I hope. So are these application questions helping you all? I'm really trying. I heard you all's feedback that you needed more application questions to help you prepare for the test. So is this helping you? Okay. Yes, I'm glad. Thank you, Morgan. Um, all right. I will send out this PowerPoint as soon as I get as soon as I get everyone's attendance um, taken care of, I'll send out the PowerPoint. Um, Fallon is having her study session, I believe it is Thursday, but um, she will send out an email with all that information, like always. Don't forget your test opens on Friday. Um, it's open all weekend. Start studying now. Do not wait and cram it. Yep, I will still send out the PowerPoint right after the session. All right. Well, you guys are free to go unless you have any questions. I'll stop the recording. So if you have questions, you and I can chat afterwards if you want. Um, as soon as I get off here, I'll send the PowerPoint so you guys will have stuff to study by. And have a good night, everyone. Thank you for coming.